Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Turn to a couple of people and tell them, I'm not going to be left behind. I'm not, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be left behind. Smith Wigglesworth says, if you are in the same place with your walk with God today as you were yesterday, you're backslidden. No amens on that one, huh? He was a somewhat of a forceful individual, and yet there is probably more people seen raised in, from the dead in his ministry than, um, uh, I don't know how many, but he was, he was all sold out for God. And that's what he was. It wasn't a sense, he wasn't saying it in a way that would make us feel condemned, but the way to say we need to be continually following. I'm not, I can't get comfortable where I am because there's more with God. And, I, and, and my flesh may get uncomfortable as I'm following God, but I'm going to continue to follow after him in all that we do. We started last week, and I want to, I and my purpose here is not for us to teach for more information. I'm not here to try to persuade you to believe a particular way. I just want to revisit the word of God and stir us up afresh and just be bold and blunt enough to say that Jesus is consistently, eternally the same, and I want to see more of that Jesus than what I've ever seen in my past. That I want us to experience more of Jesus in our life. This Jesus that is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I want us not to wait till we get to heaven before we experience some of these things. You know, when we get to heaven, everything's going to be wonderful. But I think it's time for us to have some more heaven on earth. I'm not trying to be rude or crude. I'm just, I think if there's going to be hell on earth, we ought to have heaven on earth also. And how's that going to happen? It is going to happen from the church because the church will prevail against the gates of hell. And so that means the kingdom of heaven has to be coming against those. And so I want us to, to just be stirred up again that, the, that we're magnifying Jesus. We're not trying to, to magnify ourselves. We're not trying to build something up, work something up. We're just saying we're going to lift up Jesus and we're going to, la- we're going to expect this same Jesus to be manifested in our lives and amongst us. In Hebrews 13, 8, it says, Jesus Christ is eternally changeless, always the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that's what we want to go, we want to look at the book of, the, in the, the Gospels and go back and look at the Gospels, specifically in the area of healing, and see Jesus at work, Jesus doing what Jesus did, and what Jesus still wants to do today. And I want us to, to, to go and we'll just start in Matthew And we're just going to look at some of these amazing healings that Jesus ministered to people. And we've seen, last week we talked, Jesus hasn't changed. People's needs haven't changed. The devil hasn't changed. And so the church, we shouldn't change. We should get back to what Jesus, the head of the church, was doing, following his example and having his results in people's lives today. We want to prove heaven while improving earth. We're not going to talk people into or argue people into getting saved. We want to just manifest God's goodness and grace, let them see the goodness of God, and that we'll be lived. Jesus always left people better off than when he first met them. I think that's what the church ought to be doing. That whatever the need was of the person, Jesus met that need, and they were better off after he was with them. We know that uh, just Matthew chapter 9, you can, you can uh, we read the scripture last week. I'll just read it to you real quickly here. Matthew 9, 35, Jesus went throughout the cities and villages in Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the gospel of the kingdom, healing every kind of disease and, and every kind of sickness. His, I like the Amplified. It says, his words and his works Reflect, uh, uh, reflecting his messiahship. His words and his works reflecting his messiahship. What does that mean? Because he was the messiah, it showed up in what he said and what he did. If we're the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, then it ought to show up in the words and the works that we do today. That's what we're going with. So we're just going back and we're just looking at Jesus, his ministry, what he did, how he did it, and we're see that there's many different ways that, that he ministered healing, many different ways, but he never turned someone down from healing. That's good news. Now, we know that as we look through the scripture that there's many times that he, 
he, he ministered to a, a massive amount of people, and everyone there was healed. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, most of us will never be in a situation where there's a mass amount of people, but all of us will come eye to eye with somebody sick. Huh? If, if, you, and, uh, if you don't know someone sick, I can introduce you to some people, but, but, but we're all going to come confront people one-on-one. -on -one. And so I want to look at some of the ministry of Jesus on the one-on-one -on -one situation because that's where most of us are at. Most of us will minister one-on-one -on, -one on people, and I want us to know how to minister healing, how to release it, or at least get us stirred up in expectation. I, I, I tell you, there's a, we could say there's, there's limitless ways God could minister healing. And we just need to, but the problem is most, of, most church people, now I know you guys are, are with me on this, but a lot of church people aren't expecting Jesus to heal today. A lot of religion has taught that God's trying to teach you something through sickness and disease. Some religious saying even that, that God is, gets glory through the pain that you're going through and the suffering. Now, I'm going to give God glory regardless of what happens to my life, but I'm not going to give God glory for the cancer in my life, the pain in my life, the disease in my life, the demon in my life. And so we need to stir, get, make sure that we're stirred up here that we, that we, as we're going along. And sometimes if we're not careful, we make assumptions from our perspective instead of following directions from our example. Sometimes we jump to assumptions. Well, I did this and that happened and they didn't get healed. So must be that God doesn't want to heal. Must be God doesn't want to do things. Assumptions are a bad thing. You start to assume the wrong thing and you can get yourself in a true story. Ready for a true story? I'm not preaching now here. I'm telling you a true story. True story in, in Sarasota, Florida. Sarasota, Florida. An elderly woman goes out to get in her car after shopping and sees four men leaving to attempting to leave in her vehicle. She drops her bags and whips out her sidearm and she hollers at the top of her lungs, Get out of the car. I have a gun, and I know how to use it. They didn't, they didn't at, wait for a second warning. They all just scattered out of that vehicle. She was, of course, nervous with adrenaline. She stops. She pauses. She picks up her, her bag. She gets in the car. She tries to get the keys into the ignition. She can't get it in. It can't get in. It can't get it in. She figured, why can't I get this in? And then she kind of figured out probably the same reason why there's a Frisbee and a football in there. And she paused for a few months and then discovered her car was about four slots down. So she goes and gets in her car, drives down to the, the police station to tell them of her mistake. And the police officer is laughing uncontrollably because he said, you see those four guys over there? And there was four pale individuals that had come in and reported of a carjacking of an elderly woman that was described as less than five feet tall, white curly hair, wearing glasses, and carrying a large um, handgun. And, uh, and so, you see, her perception was that they were stealing her car. Their perception was she was trying to steal their car. And if we just make assumptions, we all get messed up. That's why we need to stick with the word of God and so that we don't make assumptions along the way, but we know fact. Here's a fact. Matthew's gospel, chapter five, or excuse me, chapter eight, verses five through 13. This is, this is fact. This is Jesus ministering healing. And, uh, and he says that the works we do, that he did, we should do also. Here, it says uh, the uh, centurion's son, uh, servant is healed. Centurion was not even a, a, a Jew wasn't an Israelite. He did not have a covenant with God. He did not qualify under the Mosaic covenant. And so he didn't have the right to call on God for healing. And yet we see the mercy of God even working in this person's life. Stop right now and let the Holy Spirit bring someone to your mind that you think does not deserve healing and replace that assumption with the fact God still wants to heal them. God still wants to heal them. How do I know that? 
Do you know anybody that you think doesn't deserve to be forgiven? Do you? And I want you to know that God still wants to forgive them. Jesus said, it's no more difficult for me to forgive than it is to heal, or vice versa. So we have this situation here. We, it, it, it rattles our religious thinking a little bit because oftentimes we think that you've got to be good enough for God to heal you. You've got to, to be good enough for God to work in your life. And so oftentimes if we're not careful, before we'll go and, and believe God to, for healing in someone's life, we'll stop and wonder. I wonder if they're, if they're good enough. I just want you to know God's goodness is enough to make up any shortcoming in our lives or people's lives of not being good enough. So here in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 8, and we'll just start reading here verse 5 in this particular situation, and we'll learn from it. Now, when Jesus had entered into a Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, uh, dreadfully tormented. Notice the quick response of Jesus in verse 7. Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. I hope you have that underlined in your Bible in some way. Jesus didn't pause, wonder if it was God's will or not. Jesus didn't pause and wonder if, if, if he was learning something in his torment. He didn't pause and wonder whether there was uh, something that he needed to get right with God before he was going to heal him. Those sometimes could be situations, but we see here the first response of Jesus is, I'm going to come and minister healing. I want him to be well. I want him to be healed. I want us to start looking at every sick person and say, God wants them to be healed. Every single one of them. Jesus said, I will come and heal him. And then centurion answered and said unto him, Lord, I'm not worthy uh, for you to come under my roof. Here's the amazing thing. But speak the word only, and my servant will be healed. Isn't that incredible? Speak the word only, and, he, and, and my servant will be healed. Now, he wouldn't necessarily have known it, but Psalm 107 said that God sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Jesus was a man of spiritual authority, and if we take the time to read on here, uh, Jesus says, I can't believe, that, or not, I can't believe, but he said, I'm amazed at your faith. But the, the centurion says, I'm a person of authority. I understand what it is when I tell one of my uh, people under me to do this, they do it. And, and I'm under authority. If someone tells me to do something over me, I, I do it. And so all you need to do is speak the word and my servant will be healed. Speak the word. Speak the word. Speak the word. Speak the word. Not your word. Speak the word. Huh? Speak the word of God with authority in our... Speak the word. Jesus... Do you think Jesus said, well, I'll try it? No. He spoke that word with confidence. He spoke that word in faith. He spoke that word. He sent that word, just like you would send an email today. How does that work? How do you send? I mean, isn't that incredible that I can, could, can send art a text message from my phone, goes to a tower somewhere, jumps up to a satellite somewhere, back and forth or something or other, and gets back to his phone. How did I send that text I don't know how I did it necessarily, but by faith, I get my phone out and do it. Folks, we need to get the word out, and we just send it by faith and believe that God is watching over his word to perform it in life, in Jesus' name. He sent his, the word, he spoke the word, and it went forth. Verse 13, we'll just jump down here, and when Jesus said, uh, 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 then Jesus said to the centurion, go your way, and as you are believed, so it will be done unto you. The centurion's faith was involved here, but uh, it would have no, no effect if it wasn't for the authority of the word of God. Does Jesus give us the permission to, to speak his word today? Yes. So we're not trying to talk God in. Again, Jesus didn't pray that he would be healed. Jesus spoke the word and he was healed. So in your life right now, who is it? Because this is what I want to do. If we go through this, you, you've heard me teach before. You've heard, you've, you can read your Bible. But let's practice some of these things. Who is it maybe that you could write down right now that you think, I need to send the word of healing into them right now? Where it doesn't matter how far away they are. doesn't matter where they are. doesn't matter what situation. 
it doesn't say that the servant was believing for healing. It said that the centurion had some faith. Let's exercise our faith. Let's be in this story, in one sense, let's be the centurion and Jesus at the same time. Let's send the word and release our faith. Who is it right now that you could just say, I send healing to them in Jesus' name. It is God's will for them. I send the word of the Lord into their life. And God's word is for them to be healed and to be whole and to be made right. I send that word and he watches over his word to perform it. I send the word into their life of healing and wholeness in their lives. Now, the moment you do that, if the Holy Spirit wants to reveal anything to you, maybe there is something else that needs to be said or done. Maybe there is an and that goes along with that, the Holy Spirit that reveals to you. Maybe there is a demonic force that needs to be dealt with. Maybe there is something that needs more that needs to be listened to the Spirit of God because we just aren't going to take this like a cookie cutter and just quote it like a parrot. We have to follow after his example in faith because faith is always seen in these our faith has got to be about not just, a, not just, I sent the word, I said this verse, I said this verse, I said this verse, so then it just happens. No, it's got to come out of a heart full of faith that I know that God's working, God's moving, God's changing, and that we're releasing our faith in it. Here we see that this was great faith. Jesus said, I've not seen such great faith, no, not in all Israel. He's saying, there's these people that have a covenant with me and have a word with me through Moses, through Abraham, and they're not exercising the kind of faith that this centurion has. So here's a glimpse that we need to make sure we know. God's word is greater than sickness and disease. God's word has more authority than sickness and disease. We have to get that confidence on the inside of that, stirred up on the inside of us, that when we send that word, that healing goes forth into that individual's life. That the will of God is starting to be revealed in that individual's life. That they're laying there. Maybe they're in pain. Maybe they're in, in kind of some kind of sickness. I don't know what the situation is. But when we sent the word, not only do we expect the manifestation of healing, we expect that word to be planted on the inside. That that holy thought comes into their heart also that holy thought starts to stir on the inside of them that it's God's will for them to be healed, that God wants me to be better. God wants to change my life. This is going to be a testimony for God's goodness and greatness. So I want to encourage as we look at this one particular scripture, just right now in your life, who do you need to be speaking the word over? You know, in a sense, we've said it jokingly, and yet it probably isn't something we want to... Uh, when I grew up, we, we would, on Sunday nights, we had church. Imagine that. Imagine that. Crazy. Sunday night, we had church. We had Sunday school on Sunday morning. We had church on Sunday morning. We had church on Sunday night. We had church on Wednesday night. And oftentimes, we'd go to, to home groups where we'd just meet in people's homes um, sporadically, oftentimes once or twice a week. And so, we'd get together. But sometimes at church, especially on Sunday night, we'd turn in prayer requests. And people would have unspoken prayer requests. I don't know if some of you are raised in church. Unspoken prayer requests. They want you to pray about something, but they don't want you to know what it is. And then there was some people who would really want you to feel it, so they would have special unspoken prayer requests. That was a whole other classification of the mystery of what you're supposed to pray about, but we don't know what you're praying about. Folks, we need to know what we're praying about. We need to know what we're dealing with. And we need to, to see results. I don't know if one, I can't tell you if one of those prayer requests ever got answered. Because I don't know what it was. I think we need to be believing God and seeing some answers and let know this is God moving. Amen? It's God moving. Maybe even getting bold enough to with some of these people that you're sending the word to, maybe even send them a note or a call or something and say, I'm believing God for healing in your life. I'm, start to send the word. Maybe they even need to hear that word coming out of your mouth coming into their lives and encouraging them. Believing God for it, to move miraculous in their lives. And so we see that the centurion servant here, he, got, he, he is healed. He's do, set free. 
And it's God's will to demonstrate the authority of God's word as we believe it in our lives today. Do you believe God heals today? Do you believe God is able to heal today? Do you believe God wants to heal today? Then we ought to be exercising and releasing that authority in our lives and seeing it come to pass. We can see that faith is released, especially when we, we believe in the authority of God's word. Do you believe the B-I-B-L-E? Getting a little bit weaker there. Do you believe the Bible? Yes. The enemy is taking great efforts to try to get us to not believe this is the, Bi- the word of God. Faith comes from the word. Amen? And so if the enemy can get us to, to be uh, uh, doubtful of the word, doubtful of the will of God, and then we are contained to where we are, but we're going to release the authority that we have. The Bible says, Jesus said, I will come and heal him. I will, I will, I will, I will. Amen? It's God's will to heal. Well, but I know somebody that died. It's God's will to heal. Well, I know someone that prayed they didn't get healed. It's God's will to heal. Well, I prayed once and I didn't get... uh, It's God's will to heal. We cannot base our our, our expectations on God on our past experience because it just limits us to where we were. Amen? Amen. We want to go to where God is. Jesus came to be an example, and so we need to be making sure that we're speaking the word out of our lives. It'll change the circumstances, the situation we're at. Quickly, we'll look at another one here tonight because we, we just want to keep stirring ourselves up with an expectation of ministering healing. And uh, I, I'm trying to catch myself because we even oftentimes just say it ourselves, praying for, for healing. Uh, w- as we look at these illustrations, it's hard to find an example where Jesus prayed for, the, for someone for healing. Isn't that interesting? The church, 99% of the time, says, pray for so-and-so, they're sick. Jesus said, speak the word. Jesus said, cast out. Jesus says, lay hands on. Hard to find a place where Jesus prayed. For the sick. Maybe we ought to do it Jesus' way. Maybe we get different results along the way. Huh? We've got the right heart. Let's just start to believe. I'm not saying we can't pray for the sick. I know the scripture tells us that, that, that there's other places that we can't. But, but let's follow after the example of Jesus here more than anything. What did he do to his mother-in-law here? We're just continuing on, just reading some verses here on Peter's mother-in-law in uh, Matthew chapter 8, start reading in verse 14. This is just good, keeps going right on here. In Matthew 14, and then when Jesus came in, into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laying sick with a fever. You see, sometimes we think, well, we don't want to bother God with anything that's not cr- uh, 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 terminal or, or a crisis. But here you have a mother-in-law with a fever, just laying there, out of your way, not giving you any problems, quiet, just... She's, she's off to the side. Some men maybe would pray that their mother-in-law would be laying there with a fever. I don't know. But, but here, she's laying there with a fever. Doesn't say that she's about to die or, or it's 108 or anything like that. She's laying there with a fever. Verse 15, what's it say? Verse 15, so he touched her hand and, and, and the fever left her and she ministered unto them. Isn't that interesting? Jesus just goes over and touches her. No magical words here. He didn't send the word here. He went over and touched her, and the fever left her. Are we supposed to do the works Jesus did? There ought to be more of an awareness of the healing power of God in our life than the fever in someone else's life. What do we see? Someone with a fever? What do we, we're going to check to see if you got a fever. We're checking to verify you have a fever when our response should be, if I'm going to touch you, I'm going to touch you with the power of God to transform and change your life. Huh? Well, what if they don't get healed? Guaranteed they won't be healed if you're just t- trying to find out what their, what their temperature is. 
Jesus, it, he, he touched them. Well, that was Jesus. Yes, it is. Thank God it was Jesus. And who are we? We are the body of Christ. We are now the representatives of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are the ones now that we need to be even chasing fever out of bodies. Why? So she could get up and minister. She could get up and serve. I, don't have, I mean, my wife's not here tonight because she doesn't feel good. She's sick at home. Well, did, did I touch her? Yeah, I touched her. I spoke the word over her. Did all, you know, sometimes as, a, as the husband, you're not the best preacher, you know, uh, in some situations, if you know what I mean. So I could sit here and say, well, I'm going to preach on healing if my wife's homesick. No, that's when I need to preach on healing. That's when we need to be reminded that the word of God's true even when it's, it, it, then we're being, uh, being tempted to be discouraged along the way. Amen? And so I just want to encourage, who, now that, here's another thought for us, getting close to running out of time, who is it that you need to touch? Jesus spoke the word and they were healed. Who is it that you just need to touch? Now, please, sometimes we get so religious. I'm going to pray for you right now, lady. I'm going to just get ready, get ready, get, re you get, you get ready, because I'm going to touch you. And when I touch you, Jesus just went over and touched your hand. I think sometimes we are looking for the dramatic, and we're, and we're skipping over just the very fact the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. I'll be honest, I, I like it when I get the extra feeling. I like it when I get the fire. I like it. Some, but if I don't get all of those things, the word's still true. The word's still true. Jesus went over and touched her and drove the, fe the fever out of her body. That I think it's wonderful that he gives us such dramatic changes. The, the man is palm paralyzed and tormented. Jesus speaks the word and he is healed. And a woman that's just laying there ill with a fever and just able to go over and just touch her hand. And the goodness and the compassion and the love of God flowing through her and she's able to get up and able to minister and to do what God's called her to do. I want us to just not just memorize these stories, I want us to practice the word of God in our life. I want us to stop and let the Holy Spirit use us as we see people, that we speak the word, that we start to send the word, and we, and we send the word, and we send, and we send the word. But we also look for opportunities for individuals. Maybe it's somebody that doesn't even like you, and you can just walk up, I hope that's not you, Qual, but somebody just, and you can just touch them. Touch them. You know, I've used the illustration many times here, and it's just this time of year, so it's starting to happen again. Sam walking around and, and uh, shocking, you know, in, at, because of the carpet or whatever. There should be a holy shock in our life. That's why we need to be full of the Holy Spirit and not just saved. Huh? That's why we need to be, be consumed with the Spirit so that our cup's running over. Not just enough in it for us. That's why we should have the expectation of ministering to others at any time. Not just at the end of the service where we have a couple over here that will be able to pray for you and they have super faith and they'll be able to take care of all your needs. But that you're ready. Jesus, Jesus didn't say, well, come to church tonight and we'll pray for you. Huh? He didn't say next month we're going to have a healing revival. Come to that. As he went along in life, this guy comes up and says, speak the word and my servant will be healed. Gets done at the end of the day and goes home to a friend's house. Peter's mother-in-law is there. Touches her. Still got enough God in you. At the end of the day, do you still have enough God in you that you can minister healing to someone else? Huh? Always looking for that opportunity. Healing is good and all, God's always ready to do good. And praying for others. This is not just to, to, for ourselves. But this is so that we can make a difference in the world around us and other lives around us. We need to get back to believing that God is a supernatural God and he wants to do supernatural things in our lives. What is stopping you from taking steps of faith right now in just those two situations? Huh? What do we need to do right now? And not wait for an evangelist, not wait for the next preacher to come through, but as believers... 
in these situations. Why won't we do it? We're afraid it might not work. Get rid of the fear and start getting faith operating in your life. What if they don't get healed? It, it, we're, if you don't do it in a, in, a, in a religious way, if you don't do it in, in some flamboyant way, if you'll just do it in a godly way, it, folks, I want you to know that we start putting our faith out there, we start seeing results, and we start seeing some things happen, it starts stirring our faith up. Well, what if only 10% of the people get healed? You're pretty excited if you're in that 10% category, folks. Huh? But I'll encourage you and tell you this, if you start seeing 10% of the people you minister to getting healed, before long, you're going to have 15. Before long, you're going to have 20. Before long, you're going to... Because we're going to build this expectation of what Jesus still wants to do in our day and our hour. I know still, I, I, I'm, I want to speak with compassion, but I want to challenge this. There's a, there's a world out there that needs to see the power of God flowing through your life. And I would much rather have them come in and testify that you did something and God healed them than always just bringing the sick here and wanting super pastor to be able to do something because of some amazing thing I supposedly did. No, you got the same Holy Ghost I got. What are you doing with him? Maybe we could say it this way as we close. What is he doing with you? So Father God, we just thank you for your presence. Thank you, Jesus, you have not changed. Thank you, Jesus, that you have allowed us, Lord, seemingly a small group, Seemingly a, a, an insignificant amount of people compared to the, the problems and, and even the size of other churches. But, but God, we've given ourselves over to you and we're saying we desire to see your power move not for some, some uh, of our own reasoning, Lord God, of, 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 of insecurity or our own glory. We want more glory God for God. We want more glory for you. And we want to see lives powered to change by the goodness of God. And so... Lord, I just thank you. You're using this church, these individuals that go out into this dark world of hurting people that are full of sickness and disease, and you're sending us out full of your word, and so we are taking the word with us, and we are simply speaking out your word wherever we go and sending your word, sending blessings, Father God sending the blessing of healing into people's lives and that we're touching people. If a prophet that has been dead in a tomb could, be, could raise someone else from the dead because of the power of God in his dead body, how much more should the power of God in us transform and change and, and bring health and wholeness to those that we touch in Jesus' name? So God, we're just asking that you would uh, uh, just open our spiritual eyes to be able to see how to be more like Jesus and meet the, the needs of the people around us for your glory. We are tired of regretting not doing and seeing people suffering and dying. We want to see the power of God flowing for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.